we start with militant evangelism, let us have first, uh, let me uh, just inform you that Pastor Emmanuel is not here today because he's in misery. So I'm here substituting my husband, and I hope by the grace of God, we can, uh, I can uh, deliver the word that is expected of God and you, of course. Okay, so before we start, let us have a recap of what we had already studied. First and foremost, foremost we started with the Great Commission. Of course, we were able to know that God left us a commission that we need to do, right? That is to go, yea, and make disciples of all nations. And then we proceeded to revival. We were able to learn also that we cannot go outside unless we are revived, right? Unless that we have that fire in us. That the deadness in our body, in our mind, and our spirit is being restored back. Unless that we have that fire in us to do the work of God and go forth outside and do the commission. So revival should start from us. The next is the church triumphant. There we had studied about how God is restoring back his church. As he, as he said, this is my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail. And we were able to study the fivefold ministries that is being kept in the church, working together in order to accomplish the purpose of the church. Though we know, of course, that we are the church, the building blocks of a living church whose head is Christ, right? The next one is the last one, of course, last Friday, you were able to learn about the authority of the believer. It started with God giving the authority to man, but he fell, right? But then we were restored back. Jesus came and restored back the authority that is for us. The keys of heaven and earth is given back to you and me. So you have to stand straight, okay, with confidence that you have authority in Christ, right? So that is the authority of the believer that you were able to know last time. Today, we are going to proceed with militant evangelism. Well, me, when my husband first told me that he's going to teach about miracle evangelism, I thought that, you know, I need to go outside. I need to know the pattern on how to do it, right? Maybe most of you have that concept in their mind. Even my daughter is saying, Mark, I was thinking that dad will tell them about practical evangelism, how to do, right? But you know what? I'm a nurse by, a pro by profession. We do first theory, then we go for practice. We need to be fully equipped, well-rounded in what we are supposed to do in order for us to go forth and do the work that is before us. So when I, am, I, I go through the lessons it really aims to equip each and every one of us to know what is this miracle evangelism and the component that is within it. So he said to me also, my husband told me that tell them that next week I will be teaching them about practical evangelism. So I hope you will be all here next Friday. So here, Militant evangelism. First of all, what is the meaning of militant? When we say militant is, you have to be engaged in warfare or combat. That means to say fighting. 
having or showing a desire or willingness to use strong, extreme, and sometimes forceful methods to achieve something. So when you say militant, that means to say we are engaged in some sort of war. We are in warfare, whether we like it or not. If you are in the kingdom of God, we, we are not exempted. Okay? Here, as we have learned before, what is evangelism? It is the weaning or revival of personal commitment to Christ. It can be also defined as militant or crusading zeal. What is your commitment to Christ when you, when you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Did you not sing that, oh, you know, uh, when you are newly baptized, when you are baptized, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. That song itself is a commitment, right? When you spoke the word and release it, that is a commitment to follow Jesus. And what is Jesus uh, willing to do? He laid down his life. He loved us so much. And his will, he, he, he sacrificed. He, he came to seek to save the lost. So if that is the one that we profess, that is we are committed to follow him, we should be like him. Okay? Now, so if we say that we are in Christ, that means to say that this militant evangelism denotes warfare. We are at war, not physically, but spiritually. To be at war, a person needs to be trained, he needs to be disciplined, and he needs to be vigilant. And as a militant engaging in warfare, we have to know three things. First, we should know our objective. Second is we should know the enemy. And the third one is we should know our weapon. Okay. Just think of soldiers going to Marawi. Okay, that is now besieged by the ISIS, and thanks God, it is being you know slowly, slowly freed by the uh, army. When the soldiers will go forth in a place, the commander will tell them what is the purpose why they are going in that particular place. And they should know who are the enemy, right? If you know the enemy, even in, in just ordinary uh, activities that we are doing, you go forth to... Uh, uh, to uh, undergo this chess competition, chess. If you know your opponent, what you will have to do? You will have to study the moves that he had previously, right? So for me to overcome, I have to know his usual moves so that I know how to counterattack. I should know the weapon that I have to use. So these are the three things that we need to know as soldiers of God. First, we'll discuss the objective, okay? What is the objective? Why we are enlisted in the kingdom of God? As I said before, God's objective to come here on earth is to seek and to save the lost. So it should have to be the same with us. And also, of course, we need to protect, we need to secure, and we need to take back what was taken from us. Our families, our nations, the lost, our friends who were lost, 
Okay? These are our objective. Now, the second point is, as I said, you have to know the enemy. Our enemy is the world, the flesh, and the, the devil. In John chapter 2, 15 to 16, it says, do not love the world. God is saying, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world that is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life come not from the Father, but from the world. The world offers physical things that is temporal. It does not satisfy the spirit. As it is written in John chapter 3, verse 6, flesh gives birth to flesh, and spirit gives birth to spirit or to the spiritual life. The fleshy world will love the world, and it rules. You know the ruler of this world. S is the ruler of this world right and it wants us to indulge ourselves in the physical things and not with spiritual if you have to observe the world it is taking more of our time than spending time with the lord it is trying to pull us away it is for you to know that there are two spiritual forces the good and the evil one. We are here in the middle. It is for you to decide which way to go. The third one is we should know our enemy. Who is our enemy? Hmm? His name is, he's the devil. Sometimes, you know, my brother-in-law doesn't want to speak even the name. Okay? Pastor, uh, Pastor Anthony. With this, he will put S. With the name of the enemy, he will say yes. Okay? And he's also called the dragon. That's why sometimes me and my husband, whenever we, we see the sign of the dragon, we try to eliminate from our house. His name is the serpent. And his purpose, we should know his purpose. His purpose is to overthrow God's plan to raise up mature and glorious church, who, which is destined to win nations with good news of Jesus Christ. This hinders the work of the believers. Their plan is to destroy men, to kill, to steal, and to destroy S is their leader, and D are his followers. They are in hierarchy. They are stationed in many places. As it is written here, there are demon spirits over families, over districts, over regions, over nations. We call them territorial spirits. They are there watching. And you know, even in how we speak, when we speak curses, they move to accomplish what is being spoken. So we need to be vigilant. We need to be watchful in whatever we do, whatever we think, and whatever we speak. Okay? So they are ready to move forward to steal God's children. They demonize God's people. You tell me that's not true. The Bible says that, you know, there were people even now that is being demonized. No, no, the, you know, the, the demon is over uh, what he call this, uh, is entering into the body of humans and they try to rule over that body. The natural way of that human being will not be manifested, but the, the, the spirit that is within him is the one that is trying to rule. And you can see bizarre things that is going on. It's because 
that enemy has entered the flesh of the person. So they are real. We are in the real world. Though we are here physically, there is a spiritual warfare that is going on. So, as I said, war is going on in spiritual realm. Just remember the prayer of Daniel, right? He prayed to God, but it is hinder. It hinders the answer. God's answer is already sent forth, but on the way, there is warfare between the enemy and the angel of God. Okay? So, the prayer, the answer for that prayer is being hindered for how many days? 21 days. So, there is something that is going on in the spiritual realm. In Revelation 1, in, in Revelation 12, 7 to 11, it will give us an idea how war in heaven broke out. War between the angels of God and the legions or the angels of S, the follower of S. But of course, we know very well that these fallen angels, they were thrown out. Why? You think they will win? Any creation will win over the creator? There's no one. Any, any student is above his teacher? There is no one. Even Jesus spoke also about that. So if we are in Christ, we are already victorious. We are winners. We are in the winning side, not the losing side. So we need to know who we are in Christ. The Amalekites. Joshua fought with Amalekites. Joshua typifies Jesus. Amalekites Amalekai represents Satan. But who won? Joshua won because God is with him. So now we proceed to this warfare in evangelism. To be in warfare, we must operate in God-given rights of binding and loosing so captives can go free. Expect direct confrontation with the principal rulers. It's not easy. What he's trying to say to us here is going into the spiritual realm and fighting these spirits is not easy for us to do. But first, you should know about the strong man. Exercise your authority. Possess occupied lands and know, you should know how to enter into warfare. The lack of knowledge as intercessors, we often fail to directly attack the unseen forces or darkness. In Matthew 18, 18, it says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound on heaven and whatever you lose, will be loose in heaven. These are the words that God has given us to, be, to give us strength that this is the way. This is the way how to do it. You have the power to bind. You have the power to lose. So do it. God did not leave us orphan. God did not leave us alone, but he left us with his words to overcome the enemy. In Thessalonians 2, 1 Thessalonians 2, 18, it says, Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. Hindering, they are hindering spirits. They are trying to block us from the things that we need to do. So you should know that, that when you plan to do something, you also have a plan on how to do it and how to uh, push the hindering spirits that you expect to go before you. We must break 
in this evangelism, if you wanted your people to have an open eyes, you have to break their spiritual blindness of, un, of those unbelievers by blinding the demons which are ruling their lives. We must lose the light of the gospel to shine on them. So God has given us a verse here. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. You know, we are always praying for the people who doesn't know God. But because of the blindness that is in them, it is difficult, right? But we need to be persistent because God can do everything. For us, it may be impossible, but for him, it is possible because he's the God of impossible. Okay? So here is the binding and loosing way of releasing the blindness of the people. We must first bind, as I have said before, the strong man, which are the principalities. Who are they? The principalities and powers, which are ruling in, ter in territories, nations, regions, areas, families, and individuals. In Matthew 12, 29, or less, how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first bind the strong man and then he will plunder his house? You know, this is not easy. The, they have power. They are also strong. But we have to know the power that we have in us. And later on, you will know how to overcome. We are to use the gift of the discerning of spirits to recognize the ruling spirits and then to bind and cast out the strong man. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11, we have this manifestation of the spirit. It's given to each one for the profit, profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit, to another, the word of knowledge through the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same spirit. To another, the working of miracles. And to another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. And but one and the same spirit works all the things distributing to each one individually as he wills. So these are nine spiritual gifts that is coming from the Lord. When you go for warfare, you should have this discerning spirits. Not only that you have to go into one person and you know God, you know the real God, Jesus. Jesus came here to save and seek us. It's not just like that. You, have, you should have that discerning, the spirits, the discerning spirits should be in you in order for you to know the timing, when, how, where you have to do. So the strategy is from the Lord. Okay? So these are the nine spiritual gifts that the Spirit of God is giving to all his people in order to be used in this warfare. Spiritual warfare often involves persistent wrestling in the spirit realm. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of his age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. I remember Pastor Jerry. He has so many teachings that still remain in us. He says, when you are angry at somebody, or maybe they are acting weird, they are not acting normal, they're always angry, they are, you know, they are fighting, they are doing many things that is against the will of God. Do not look at the person. 
It's not the person. It's the spirit that is behind that person. That's why instead of condemning those people, you have to pray for them because now you are in the spirit realm. You know how to discern that this is not from him. It is from the spirit that is influencing this person. Amen? So you should have the spiritual gifts. Why God is telling to us, love your enemies, love your neighbor? Because inside of them, there is really that inherent love in them. But the point is, they subjected themselves to the spiritual darkness that ruins and that influences their life. So we have to pray. Maybe you have your own brothers or sisters your own families, you can see your nation, you know, our nation, especially our nation now, we can discern the spirits that are moving into those nations. But if we become lax, we just watch and just see what is the next to happen in our nation, nothing will change. But if we have to move and take hold of the authority that we have, Change will happen, and we have to be positive without doubt that in our nation, breakthrough will come. There is hope because in God, there is hope. That is not the destiny that our nations is to become. That is not the destiny that God has intended for our nations to, come, to, to be. That is not the uh, intention of God that families will be broken. Because it is designed that families should be united in one accord. This is not his design that they, they divorce, they separated and everything. That is not God's design. It's not from him. God loves us so much that he wanted the best for us. He doesn't want to ruin us. He doesn't, he, he doesn't want all those things. And those are the product of what the enemy is doing. In families, in, this, in regions, look at the region. What is happening in this region? And for us, we are reading the newspaper and we are just looking, hey, these uh, regions are having this unity. But as children of God, as people who are here, kept by God, we need to be watchful, we need to be vigilant, and we need to be prayerful. Amen? Now, and also, here in our warfare, in our warfare, we are not alone. Think, we are never alone. David wrote in Psalm 9, 11, 13, For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent, you shall trample under your foot. That's why our song is a warfare song. Amen? You just remember the time when Jesus was about to be taken, and it is in Matthew 26, 53. He said, or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father, and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? This is the time that he is uh, about to be taken by the Roman soldiers. And then Peter reacted and just took his sword and cut the ear of one of the Roman soldiers. But God healed him. Angels are there. Right? Angels are there. We are never alone. That's why when we pray in the physical realm, we are here. The movement of the spirits are there. There is also war in spiritual realm. They move as we speak. They move to accomplish, as I told you, when you speak negative, the angel of S will go and accomplish. When you speak blessing, the angels of God will move and accomplish what we have spoken. 
And he says here in Hebrews 1 to 14, are they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? As we speak the word, the angels respond to the spoken word of God and move into action on our behalf. That is what I'm saying to you. In Psalms 103 verse 20, it says, Bless the Lord, you his angels who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Heeding means listening to his word. So what is God's reassurance for us? In Isaiah 59:19, it says here, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up his standards against the enemy. The enemy will try his best to entice the people, to blind them, so they will not know the spiritual truth. The authority, also with the authority that we have. If you don't know all these things, of course, you will walk defeated because you don't know that you have authority as a child. But it's so good that Pastor Emmanuel has spoken first the authority of the believer. Right? Otherwise, if you don't know and just go outside to do evangelism, you may not know what is the power that is in you. So we need such teachings first before going out. So thanks God that he raises his standard and he cannot outdo God. He is God. Right? He knows what is in the, what is the plan of the enemy. Even from the start of the creation, he, he did already a backup plan. That if this failed, I have a backup plan. If this creation of Adam and Eve were unable to fulfill the destiny that is having authority and dominion over the earth, I have a back plan, backup plan to restore back mankind. Right? Why these are all written in the book? Right? That Jesus will come. It, these are all in the Old Testament. And it is fulfilled in the New Testament. So God knows that we are also weak. We fail. But he has planned on how to restore us back. So that now he laid down. Because he knows that the enemy is always there. He is always there to let us down but you know what his words are laid down for us to claim in order to overcome the enemy no longer before Adam and Eve are truly with God walking with God talking with God imagine you are in the presence of God but we are blessed we have not seen God, but we still believe in him. Amen? And we are taking hold of the promises of him. Why? Because to whom we will believe. Whom you will take hold. The evidence is already out. Right? The love of God is being uh, exposed, is being shown to, whole, to the whole world. His love towards us is being, is being shown. So as I said, we are not alone. Angels are with us. God is, is with us. So now we are in guerrilla training. Okay. It says here in Ephesians 6, 10, 17, Paul encouraged the believers to put on the whole armor of God and go battle with the enemy. He gave the battle cry in verse 18. It says here, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to the end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So be ready. It says here, you have to put on the whole armor of God and we need to be prayerful. 
So these are the two things that we need to have in order to go into that warfare. Now, we should, we, let, us, let us have a brief uh, knowledge about this armor of God. I know most of you knows about this. This is only just to remind you. What are the, what are the armor of God? First, we have what they will put in our waist. Belt. That is the belt of truth. The enemy, we know very well, is the father of lies. He's a deceiver. Right? There is no truth in him. So for us, knowing the truth will set us free. He can never deceive us. You know the temptation of Jesus Christ? Satan tempted him. But because of the word, because the truth, because of the truth that is inherent in him, he was able to overcome. The breastplate of righteousness. What is this all about? You know, when you imagine those Roman soldiers, they have breastplate here. What is that for? Breastplate are used to protect vital organ. The heart is the center of emotions. So we need to protect from the dart of the enemy because it is fatal. Once the dart hit your heart, what will happen? You will die, right, at once. But we need to put on the breastplate of righteousness. That is the righteousness of Christ injected in us, guards our hearts against accusations and attacks of the enemy. Next, we have to shut our feet, feet with gospel of peace. We tread, you know, when there is warfare, it's not always that the road is smooth. Right? There are areas wherein there are so many uh, grasses, you know, you will go in that uh, clay area. It is not easy. So we tread dangerous obstacles in the path of advancing soldier. We have to put on the gospel of peace as footwear to overcome the traps of the enemy. The message of grace overcomes and is essential to winning souls to Christ. Next is the shield of faith. We have the shield. Okay. Satan always sow doubt in all of us. You know, even when we pray, sometimes in the physical realm it seems impossible, and even you are praying, accept it or not, there is doubt, right? You have doubt. So who instilled this doubt in us? It is the enemy. Satan sows doubt about God's faithfulness. You have to know Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith. It is like a golden. So that shield is like a golden shield, precious, solid, and is uh, substantial. When you have that faith, unwavering if you have faith it should be unwavering faith how you will have faith it teaches us in hebrews 11 faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing the word of god aside from that faith will come upon you if you experience the goodness of god in your life the things that are impossible in your life in your family and if you pray to god and all these things happen that makes your faith more strong. Right or no? Do you agree with me? Yes. And of course, taking hold, you have the word in you. And having uh, resisted the doubts that is in us, God is there. We know who Jesus is. Right? He is an overcomer. He wants to prosper us. He wants us to give us the things that is in the kingdom. The next is the helmet of salvation. Helmet. What the helmet does? It covers your head. What is in the head? Oh, mine, yes. Wow. That's why we always say we have to capture all, the, all that is in our mind, right? And bring it down to the knowledge of the Lord. It should not pop up. 
right? In the mind, the mind is the battleground. So your head should be well protected. Okay. It preserves our thinking. It protects us from false doctrine and the temptation of our enemy. We are capable of discerning spiritual truth and deception. So the last two, the word of God. Right. How can you battle the enemy? You should be enriched with the word of God. I was telling my husband, you know what? There's a lot of things to know about the Lord. If you will go to the internet and listen the videos, the teachings of many people, and you are really saturated with all those teachings, with the word of God, you know, the bubbling that they are telling. You know, I told my husband, I now realize what the bubbling means. When you are full of the word of God, it bubbles. You want to share with others. But you know what? You cannot share if you are empty. You can share your experience. Of course, that is good enough. But you know what? You should know and show them this is the word of God says for you. And where do you will find that? You will find that in the, in the Bible, in the book. So we need to be saturated. It's not easy. That's why evangelism going out is not easy. There are times when I encounter in the Philippines, where can you find in your book that Jesus is the son of God? Of course, I am saying I know. But I don't know where I can find it. So it's very important. To win souls is very important for you to know the word of God because it is the sword of the spirit. It is the offensive. It speaks of holiness and power of the word of God. And lastly, prayer. Prayer draws strength. We have to pray in spirit. We have to be in such sort of training in the sense that we should know how to do intercessory prayer. We, have, we need to align with God's word. The believer's weaponry to take these nations out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light is through intercessory prayer. 2 Corinthians 10, 3, 5, it says here, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high things that exalt itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ. As we have learned before in Mark 3, 27, it says, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first bind the strong man and then he will plunder his house. How can you plunder? It is through this means. You have to pray. Prayer is the language of war. We need to pray for the harvest. We need to pray for nations of the world and their leaders. We have to pray for a peaceful environment. When we say peaceful, conducive environment for miracle evangelism. So when you go out, you have to pray and uh, ask for the leading of God. So here we have an example on how we are to pray in 1 Timothy 2, 1, 4. Therefore, I exhort first of all the supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, those are for nations, right? And all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved. See? Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Amen? 
See, this is God's desire and should be also our desire. Intercessory prayer be directed to the throne of God so the blindness of the hearts of men may be removed. Pray against the spiritual darkness which binds the unbelievers. Do we pray like this? We are praying God open their eyes, but I have to come against that spirit that is creating blindness of that person in the name of Jesus. And we lose the light of the gospel of truth in them so that they may see who Jesus is in their life. Right? So God is teaching us how you have to do it. This is the way how to do it. Okay? In 2 Corinthians 4, 3, 6, it says here, but even if our gospel is veiled, okay, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Who blinded? The, the ruler of this world, okay? Who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves. When you go out, it, your aim is not to edify yourself, right? Not to give glory to ourselves, but we go there for a purpose of lifting up the name of Jesus and let these people know about his salvation. For, uh, for, Jesus, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our, in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And lastly, it says here in Isaiah 43, 5 to 7, this is God's reassurance for all of us who has that passion, who has that burning fire inside of them. It says here, fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughter from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I form him. Yes, I have made him. You are not alone. Angels are there. God is with you. Victory is in Jesus. So what we need to do? We should have faith. How Joshua overcomes his enemy. He doesn't want to go out alone. He always inquire of God. He always want the presence of God with him. Because he knows when God is with him, he will never fail. Amen? So I will leave with you with these words. As it is in the last, it says here, having won the war in the spirit world. We are winners already. We are victorious. Right? But we need still to exercise. Having won this war, the war in the spirit world over its territory, we must then move in with the gospel and through miracle evangelism, reap a harvest of souls. Jesus said, God said to Joshua, be strong and be courageous. For I am with you. And this is for you to know that the battle belongs to the Lord. Hallelujah. Are you blessed today? Thank you, Lord. All glory to the Lord. And I know at, if you, if you uh, complete these uh, sessions, really when I am looking, and because I am with my husband, when he is studying and everything, I just look at oh what he is teaching, and I told, Lord, you are again putting fire in our heart. For those who are new, do you know that this church is a church on fire before? Do you know that this church is a prayerful church? Where are all those things?
We need to restore back all these things because God is in the process of restoring back his church because he is coming back again. Amen? Amen? So rise up. Rise up. You are the hope of God. Although I know he can do it, by his word, he created the whole world. It came to pass, it, everything created was created according to his plan. He can just speak, send forth the word, everyone, you know, change your mind and come into the saving knowledge of the Lord. But why he doesn't want to do it? Why? He wants you to be partakers of the joy of reaping in the harvest. Amen? So I just pray that you will have that heart. Restoration may come into you. I know, even for me, there was a time we are so like, you know, I can, I can just imagine and describe how was the church before, but I, I can see that God is bringing back all the glory that is taken back by the enemy. So we went to the enemy's camp and we took back what he stole from us. Amen? May God bless you. So next uh, time will be Pastor Emmanuel. And God bless you. And hope to see you uh, next Friday. Thank you for coming.